I will awaken the dawn as my prayer ascends to you. Well, good morning and welcome to the Journey Church. We're glad you're here to worship with us. On our next slide, you'll see our six week Easter sermon series, which is entitled His Story. Yes, I know for five weeks you've been here, and it's a five-week sermon series. But as I've been preparing all week and began to move on post-Easter, I just could not get away from this Easter series. I believe there's one more thing that we really need to talk about that will be proof, that will testify about Jesus being the Messiah, about Jesus being the Christ. On March 8th, the Word of God testifies about Jesus, and we were in John 1, 1 through 18. On March 15th, we talked about in the sermon, John the Baptist testifies about Jesus. We were in John 1, 6 through 8, 15, and 19 through 34. On March 22nd, the Heavenly Father testifies about Jesus. We were in John 5, 33 through 47. On March 29th, the people testified about Jesus. John 12, 12 through 19. On April 5th, Jesus testifies about Jesus. That's where Jesus testified about himself. We were in John 8, 12 through 32, and John 20, 1 through 18. And then today, April 12th, Jesus' wounds testify about Jesus. We'll be in John chapter 20, 19 through 31. On our next slide, you'll see today's sermon entitled, Jesus' wounds testify about Jesus. Jesus' wounds testify about Jesus. John chapter 20. 19 through 31. If you will, please turn in your Bibles to John chapter 20. But I'd like to back up from the end of last Sunday's reading just to set up the scene that we are about to encounter. So let's back up from verse 19. Let's back up into verses 16, 17, and 18. If you did not bring a Bible with you today, we have the passage up on the screens for you, and we'll be reading out of the NASB version. Verse 16. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabbani, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Stop clinging to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But I go to my brethren and say to them, I ascend to my Father and your Father and my God and your God. Mary Magdalene came announcing to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And that he said these things to her. Now let's stop there for a second. We see here that Jesus is just right outside of his tomb when he encounters Mary. Mary sees Jesus. Mary talks to Jesus. Mary hugs Jesus. Jesus talks to Mary. There's a personal exchange there. This is a person seeing a person, a person seeing them back. There's speech and there's hugs. This has really happened Then Mary runs back to the disciples and says, I have seen the Lord. Not like I've heard about it. I have seen the Lord. That is profound. She has actually seen the resurrected Messiah, the resurrected Savior. But remember, Jesus' disciples have not seen him resurrected just yet. Now we move into our verses for today's message, verses 19 through 31. Verse 19. So when it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, let's stop there. On that same day as he resurrected that morning, that night, he did not hesitate. That night, he came to see his disciples. Listen. So when it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and when the doors were shut where the disciples were for fear of the Jews... Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. And when he had said this, he showed them both his hands and his side. The disciples then rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, their sins have been forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they have been retained. But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples were saying to Thomas, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see 
in his hands the imprint of the nails and put my finger into the place of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Now you must remember that Thomas is already a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ unto salvation. But he's not believing that he is truly resurrected from the dead, not till he sees it. He knew he was his Lord going to the cross, dying on the cross, and being buried in the tomb. He knew that. He believed that. But he did not believe that Jesus had resurrected. Not until he saw it. He wanted proof. After eight days, his disciples were again inside, and Thomas with them. Jesus came, the doors having been shut, and stood in their midst and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Reach here your finger and see my hands. And reach here your hand and put it into my side. And do not be unbelieving, but believing. Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Because you have seen me, have you believed? Blessed are they who did not see and yet believed. You know, in essence, what Jesus was telling Thomas? You mean just because you saw me, you believe? What have I been telling you was going to happen? That I would go and die, and I would be dead, and on the third day I would rise again. You didn't believe my words just because I, Jesus, told you. My words were not sufficient. But your physical eyeballs are sufficient? What do you think Jesus prefers? That we believe his words? Or wait till we have eyesight proof. I believe the Messiah and the Christ would prefer that we would believe what he said, whether he was in our presence or not. Jesus said to him, because you have seen me, have you believed? Blessed are those who did not see and yet believe. Now that brought Jesus joy. For someone that believed what I said I would do, they believed it even though they never saw it with their own eyes. Blessed are those people that have done that. Did you know in the 21st century, if you are a person who has believed in Jesus Christ as the Messiah, and He is your Savior, He is your Lord, you have trusted Him by faith, that brings Him great joy that you trusted His words. Even though you didn't see Him physically after He came out of the tomb like they did, you believed what He said and you said, it is true, it has happened, I believe it. He says, blessed is the person that does that. Now, the next two verses tell why the Gospel of John was written. And I told you in one of the other sermons in this six-week sermon series is that I have only stayed within the book of John for this six-week sermon series. I didn't go into Matthew. I didn't go into Luke. I didn't go into Mark. I didn't go into the Old Testament. I didn't pull anything from the New Testament scriptures after the Gospels. For six weeks, we have stayed totally in the book of John for the proofs of what testifies about Jesus as the true Messiah, as the true Christ. This next two verses is why all of this was said and done. Listen carefully. Verse 30. Therefore, many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples which are not written in this book. What you and I know to be in the book of John was not all of what Jesus did. He did more, much more. But there is sufficient evidence in John for what he did say and what he did do. Verse 31, but these have been written so that, so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ. He's the Messiah the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in His name. So here are the proofs, once again, that Jesus truly is the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of God. The Word of God testifies about Jesus. John the Baptist testifies about Jesus. The acts, deeds, and miracles that Jesus did testify about Jesus. The Heavenly Father testifies about Jesus. The people all around him for those three and a half years are eyewitnesses and they testify about Jesus. Jesus himself testifies about Jesus. And finally, Jesus' wounds testify about Jesus. 
So, how much more proof do you need in order to put your faith in Jesus as the Messiah, as the Christ, as the Son of God, as the Savior of the world? I have told you many times, and I stand on this. I preach it with love, but I preach it with boldness. There is no other God except Jesus Christ. Not Allah. He did not do this for us. Not Buddha. He did not do this for us. New Age mysticism did not do this for us. Humanism did not do this for us. The only one that did this for us was Jesus the Messiah. Jesus the Christ. But just because Jesus has been proven to be the Messiah, the Christ, that does not mean that everyone automatically believed in Jesus then or now. Let's look at what the 11 disciples' issues were before they knew that Jesus was resurrected. We see three things in their lives. Number one, weeping. Mary was weeping. When she was outside the tomb, she was weeping. She was worried. They moved my Lord. They've taken him. They've moved him. I don't know where he is. She was broken. Her heart was deeply saddened. She was crying. She missed her Lord because that's where they laid him. Now he was gone. That deeply bothered her. She was weeping. Number two, fear. They were meeting behind locked doors for the fear of the Jews coming and the Romans coming to arrest them just like they arrested Jesus. They said, look at what happened to him. And fear set in. That's why we see Jesus tell them three times, peace be with you. Number three, doubt. At least one of the disciples had serious doubts. And you know what the beautiful thing is? Jesus knew about every one of these feelings that his disciples, his children, were feeling. Jesus took away Mary's weeping by allowing her to hug him for just a moment. That's what she needed to deal with her weeping. Jesus took away the disciples' fear by coming to them in person, not just once, but within a week, twice. Jesus also took away their fear by saying, peace be with you, three times. The Savior said, listen, peace be with you. That was a very rough eight days, in case you didn't know. Their Savior's gone. Their leader's gone. Their Messiah's gone. They're behind locked doors. They are in fear. They're trembling in their boots. They're afraid to go out. And what does Jesus say three times? He could have said anything while he was in their presence. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. Do you get it? Jesus didn't want them to live in fear. He wanted them to live in peace. Jesus also made sure to take away their doubt by showing them his wounds. He said, look at my hands. You, you, you could see it. You could see the wounds. Even though he's resurrected, you could see the wounds. You could see where they ran that spear through his side. Now let's talk about Thomas's main issue. You know, he's known in the scriptures as Doubting Thomas. Wouldn't that be sad to have the testimony of that attached to our name as we go around the people that know us and we claim to be Christians? Doubting Chip, Doubting Michelle, Doubting Cynthia, Doubting Jim, Doubting Russell, Doubting Mike, Doubting Jeremiah. Wouldn't that be awesome? To have that little adjective right before your name and people know that that's how you live out your Christian faith. Doubting so-and-so, never really quite sure that this is what happened. Just always kind of doubting. You don't want that attached to your name. Well, he was known as Doubting Thomas. Thomas doubted that Jesus arose from the dead, and there was no convincing Thomas until he could see for himself the nail scars in Jesus' hands and Jesus' side where the scar from the spear had been. Do you doubt? Some of you do. Do you think Jesus knows about your doubt? He absolutely does. Does Jesus still care about you just as much as he cared about the disciples when you doubt? He absolutely does. Here are some facts about Jesus that will bless you. 
We find them in this chapter. Jesus also tells you and me that we need to stop weeping and know that he is risen. You know that week right prior to Easter, we call it Palm Sunday, and then we have that week that leads up to his death, leads up to his arrest and his torture and his death. Boy, that's a hard week on Christians because we're really trying to focus in on what Jesus did to pay for the penalty of our sins. That's a hard week on us. Not nearly as hard as it was on him, but it really is kind of hard on us. But boy, every Christian I know, Sunday morning, Easter Sunday morning, Resurrection Sunday morning, we're like, praise God, he is risen. Many churches will say, he is risen. He is risen indeed. And there's joy. So he wants Christians to stop weeping. Why weep? The Savior lives. The Savior lives. Jesus doesn't wait long enough to help his children Before he comes in and stops their doubting, he came back the very night he had been resurrected. Jesus did not delay even one full day. He came back the same day because he knew they were doubting. He goes, let me help you with that. Stop doubting. Believe. He came that night and said, stop doubting, but believe. He came back in person just to convince one doubter, Thomas. He came back eight days later. And by the way, a locked door will not keep Jesus out of your home and life. You can lock it, you can chain it, you can deadbolt it, you can burglarize, assess it, but you can't keep the Messiah out of your house. When the Lord wants to reveal something to you, His presence will come to you. There's no locked door that can keep the Holy Spirit out of your home or your life. Now, does that mean you respond to Him? No, because when Jesus stepped inside those locked doors, when he came through that door and it was locked, he did not open it and come through it. He came through it spiritually and he stood on the other side with them. Oh, they could have kept fearing. They could have kept doubting. They could have not done what their Savior told them to do. But I want you to know that a locked door will not keep your Savior out of your home or out of your life. Jesus tells you and me to stop living in fear because of non-believers or because the government may not approve of our Christian faith in our day and time. Are there sometimes we fear being a Christian in this day and time because other non-believers in our work or maybe our neighbors or somebody else might not like it? They might disagree with it. They might put you down. They might get angry. They might unfriend you on Facebook. Do we live in fear of that? We don't need to live in fear of that. The Savior has arisen. We need to live in faith, not fear. Jesus tells us also, just like he told them, peace be with you. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. He doesn't want you to live in fear. He wants you to live in peace. Jesus tells us to stop doubting. Do you live in doubt? And if so, in what ways are you doubting God right now? There are probably people in this worship service today that are doubting God in some area of their lives or in some aspect. Why would you doubt God? If he can resurrect himself from the dead, what problem in your life can he not heal? In the book of James, the Holy Spirit, who is now here on earth to help us, since Jesus has ascended back to heaven, tells us that we are to be people who believe not be people who doubt. On our next slide, you will see a passage that discusses the consequences of doubting God as a Christian. We'll be in James chapter 1, 2 through 8 in the NASB. We're going to start in verse 2. Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials. Everybody in here is going through various trials. We're all going through various trials. I've got a various trial. You've got a various. We're all going through various trials right now. Knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance and let endurance which also means perseverance have its perfect result so that you may be perfect complete lacking in nothing but if any of you lacks wisdom let him ask of God which means pray let him ask of God who gives to all generously and without reproach and it will be given him but but is known in seminary as a contrast word but But he must ask in faith without any doubting. For the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. Have you ever been out to the beach? Have you ever seen those waves roll in? 
That's what a Christian's like when they're doubting God. One minute they're faithful, one minute they're doubting. One minute they're full of faith, one minute they're doubting. One minute they're full of faith, one minute they're doubting. It's just like sea waves. But he must ask in faith without any doubting. For the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For that man ought not to expect that he will receive anything from the Lord. I take it from that passage that the Lord is not happy about us continuing to doubt. Have faith. Stop doubting or you're not receiving anything from me. So when you pray to me, if you're not asking in faith. And by the way, this is totally not like name it and claim it theology. When we come to our Heavenly Father and we ask Him, He either says yes to that request or He says no to that request or He says wait. But He answers His children. And we shouldn't doubt that he's going to. There's so many Christians I know of I talk to, they get tired of praying. They're not sensing answered prayer from God, whether it's yes, no, or wait. They just they can't hear God. Their fellowship and their intimacy with the Almighty is just so low. They just really doubt God about everything. And then they wonder why their life is where it is. It's because God's not answering their prayers as his child. And filling them all of the blessings and riches of Jesus Christ. For that man ought not to expect that he will see anything from the Lord. That man there can mean man or woman. Let that person not expect that he will see anything from the Lord. Verse 8. Being a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. How much do you like hanging out with double-minded people? You know what we call them? We call them fickle. One minute to this way, one minute to that way. One minute to this way, one minute to that way. One minute to this way, one minute that way. I don't hang out with much people like that. That's frustrating. Let your word be your bond. Whatever you say, walk your talk. I mean, I'm that kind of a person. Now, to be a discipler of people, I have to work within those realms sometime. But I quickly get around to the point and say, look, if you say it, do it. If you're not going to do it, then don't say it. This is what Jesus says to be a man of his word. Is God a man of his word? Amen. Are we to be men and women and children of our word? Amen. So we have to get that on the table. Otherwise, discipleship will not happen. I want to share something with you that's coming out of the book of Hebrews. It's one of my favorite passages. And it constantly convicts my spirit of how I'm supposed to live as a Christian. Let me read it to you. It's Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. And I'm at the NASB. And without faith, it is impossible to please him. If you're living in doubt, you're living in fear, you're living in worry, you're living in anxiety. If you're not trusting Jesus by faith, you are not pleasing God. I don't care what you feel about your walk with God. The Bible says, which is God's word and his take on things, without faith... It is impossible to please God. Do you want to walk around every day, week in and week out, not pleasing your Lord? I don't. But all it simply requires is faith, not doubting. And without faith, it is impossible to please Him. For he who comes to God must believe that He is. Your version may say He exists. Did you know there's a lot of times that Christians really sometimes waffle back and forth? Does God really exist? Does he not? Did all this really happen? Did he not? You know, and don't say you don't. I guarantee you if I was sitting with you over coffee, you might tell me sometimes you even doubt your own salvation. But you must believe that he is, that he does exist, and, this is part two, and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. Your version may say earnestly seek him. So what's he saying here? If you want to please me, you got to do two things. you got to believe I exist, that I am, and that when you seek me, I will reward you. Guys, if that's not true, God's a liar. My God's not a liar. And I have seen that verse proven time and time and time and time and time and time again in my life. When I have faith, and I really believe he exists, and I really bank on the fact that he is a rewarder, and he is listening to my prayers, and he will answer me, and he is there to help me, he does. When I don't, he doesn't. Many of us are losing many, 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 many blessings from our Savior. 
because of the way we live our faith life. Think about it here on earth. A father who has a child that's living according to how the father says you live in our home, does not that father bless that child? What about the child that's still their child but living very disobediently? Does that child lose out on a lot of blessings from his dad? You better bet. There were years all the way up until I was about 19 that I received a lot of blessings from my dad because I was doing what my dad said. But then 19 hit. And I still lived at home, and I didn't do what my dad said. I forfeited many blessings. Still, is say, still, still my father's son, and I got a few blessings. But from 19 to 26, I forfeited more blessings than I care to really go back and recount because of my living, of my relationship with him. It's not that he quit loving. It's not that he all of a sudden put up a wall and said, I refuse to give. The blessings were coming from my father based on how I as a son was living. Does that make sense? That's what I think is happening within the body of Christ today. You cannot treat God like a genie with three wishes. And we run to God when we're in trouble. And life is one big party since high school and you moved out. And you get to do things your way. Burger King made that famous. Have it your way. And God said, if you want to have your spiritual life your way, have at it. You want to enjoy that hamburger? Faith must be without fear, without doubt, without anxiety. Did you know that anxiety is a sin? God tells us in Philippians 4, do not be anxious for anything. Do not. Stop it. Do not. He didn't say take a pill to fix it. Stop being anxious and trust me. Jesus is better than anti antidepressant. I promise you. Where's your faith today? We have proven in six weeks, just out of the Gospel of John, that Jesus is truly the Messiah. He's truly the Christ. He came back from the dead. Are you believing in him? And not just unto salvation. But does your faith have substance to where when you live as a man of faith, a woman of faith, are you seeing the power and the blessings of God on your life? I can't tell you how many people tell me they're Christians all the time. Number one, I can't see it, and half the time I don't believe it. If somebody told me they played for the Dallas Cowboys, but they wore a San Francisco 49ers uniform, I wouldn't believe them. You say you play for that team, but your uniform says otherwise. Right? Post-Easter, what are we going to do? What kind of faith are we going to have in Jesus Christ? Listen. Listen to me carefully. We all have a story. Every person in this room and watching by video later, everyone has a story. There's not a human being that's ever been created that doesn't have a story. Every person has a story. There are even famous people with very famous and powerful and unique stories. But there has never been a more beautiful, more amazing, more powerful, more incredible story than Jesus' story. His story. And it's this story that's eternal. You know, as you watch soap operas, days of our lives, as the world turns, they're just stories about people coming in and out of other people's lives. They're just stories. And by the way, they're fake stories. Jesus' story in the scriptures is real. Have you put your faith and trust and belief in Jesus Christ? Is he your Messiah? Is he your Christ? Is he your Savior? Is he your Lord? If not, he can be today. He shows you his hands and his side in the word. Does Jesus have to walk into this sanctuary to show you physically before you will believe? You can't just believe it because he said it? Are you like Thomas? i got to see it for myself. Or is Jesus' words proof enough? And if you are a Christian, where is your faith today? Are you doubting? Are you living in fear? Are you living in anxiety? Then you cannot please God. If you want a different life today, 
You've heard this morning how to have it. Let's stand and let's come as God leads. Amen? What a beautiful way to end six weeks of focusing on Jesus. All to thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. Please be true to your word this week. Please surrender your all to him. You'll never be ashamed and you'll never regret it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you today for answering our prayers. The Holy Spirit's presence was with us this morning. And Lord, I know you spoke to my heart even as I preached. I pray that everyone here would be able to just wrap their thoughts and minds and hearts and faith deeply around you today and every day the rest of their lives. If a Christian is doubting, if they're living in fear, if they're not trusting you as they should, Father, they should not respect, expect to receive anything from you. I pray that you will bless us today, Lord. As we go out in the community, people need to see that something of life change has happened to us because we've been in the presence of the Lord and worshiped him today. Something should be different about our lives. Help us as we go to exalt our Savior in word and deed. In Jesus' name we all pray. Amen. God bless you.